He started a series last week called What About Us? As you know right now, it's, we live in an us and them world, don't we? And we're hearing all kinds of things about what we should do and what we should be and what we should believe and what we don't believe and, and how our beliefs are changing. And what I believe is that it's all because we are in the middle of one of the greatest culture changes in the life of the church. I truly believe that. And really, it should be about us, not us and them. And so we're talking about that over these few Sundays. And I want to start by saying something this morning that I think is very important. Hear this, please. God hasn't blessed our church with potential to succeed. I want to make that clear. God hasn't blessed our church with potential to succeed. He's blessed us, God has blessed us with potential to obey, to obey. And I want to start this morning by reading from uh, the book of Acts. We're going to continue in Acts, and it's chapter 17. And I'm going to begin at verse 16 and read through 22. You may or may not have all that on the screen, but if you would, just uh, read this along with me. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was deeply distressed to see that the city was full of idols. Yeah, you can stand if you'd like during this time. So he argued in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons and also in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. Also, some Epicurean and Stoic philosophers debated with him. Some said, what does this babbler want to say? Others said, he seems to be a proclaimer of foreign divinities. This was because he was telling the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. So they took him and brought him to the heir of Pegasus and asked him, may we know what this new teaching is that you're presenting? It sounds rather strange to us, so we would like to know what it means. Now all the Athenians and the foreigners living there would spend their time in nothing but telling or hearing something new. Then Paul stood in front of the Areopagus and said, Athenians, I see how extremely religious you are in every way. For as I went through the city and looked carefully at the objects of your worship, I found among them an altar with the inscription to an unknown God. What, therefore, you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, he who is the Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in shrines made by human hands, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mortals breath in all things. From one ancestor he made all nations to inhabit the whole earth, and he allotted the times of their existence and the boundaries of places where they would live so that they would search for God and perhaps grope for him and find him, though indeed he is not far from each one of us. You can be seated. Paul was preaching something that we are still preaching today. And today we need to leave with a clear understanding of what and why we worship. It's not an us and them thing. We're in such a strange time right now, and everything says the opposite of what I'm going to tell you this morning. But this us event that we do when we come together and are active as the church, this, this us event that we come together in this place, even this morning, to worship is so very important. Please hear me. We are on the edge, we are on the absolute edge of the most important time, I believe, in the history of the church, as I said earlier. In, in the past, the church has disagreed on matters of theology. That's been a part of our history. But never, never has the church questioned what God's very creation means, like we're doing that right now. This is a new kind of thing for us. It, it, it really, as you study 
the, the, the way the world will look as we get closer to the return of Christ, you see things more vividly, I believe, than we ever have before. We've never in, the, in our history questioned the sanctity of life, the sanctity of marriage like we are doing at this moment. This is a new time for us. And Christians, it seems, sometimes are just a part of the conversation and really not leading well in this moment. Just a quick word. You, you see that, that Paul goes back to the beginning of time here as he talks to the Athenians. These are folks that would have thought he was kind of behind the times. He was on the wrong side of history, so to speak. They were looking to go forward, and this man, they saw him preaching something that seemed odd to them. It seemed out of place. It seemed mystical, as you read here. It was somewhat mystical, but it was out of place because of their experience. God begins scripture, the very beginning in Genesis, with a marriage. Did you know that? He, he begins it with marriage. In, in, in Revelation, he ends scripture with a marriage. And throughout scripture, God is clear on how precious, how very precious each life is. Not because of what happens on this earth in the physical but because, as God tells us, we were knit together in our mother's wombs. He knew us, Scripture says, even before we were conceived. We can't understand what we, what we actually worship without understanding some crucial beliefs and differences between paganism and Christianity. And really, that's what Paul was up against. A lot of that has not changed. Let me assure you, you will always worship something because you were created to worship. I was created to worship. You will find something to worship. Even atheists who say they don't believe in God worship something because we were created to worship. And we need to know why. We need to know why. And in the midst of that, we must know that our goal in our beliefs is not to get us to heaven that's not our ultimate goal god will take care of that god's already taken care of that actually it's to keep us on the path of following the why remember we talked about the why of jesus christ and that is this luke chapter 9 verse 10 you want to know jesus's why his why, W-H-Y. Luke 19.10 says, The Son of Man has come to seek and save the lost. The Son of Man has come to seek and save the lost. What is the number one most recognized symbol in the world? It's the cross. It's the cross. Yet, we still have a lot of work to do in explaining the meaning of the and the beauty of that symbol on the screen right now folks see it every day somewhere they pass by a church they pass by a sign it pops up in their internet feed or their social media feed but we are still in 2021 trying to explain what the beauty is of that symbol and really what it means it's not about going across the sea, even though we do that. You've heard from our missionaries this morning. It's not even solely about going to the next country over. It's about the holistic view of reaching lost souls for Christ. And most of us, most of us have a mission field right off the end of this parking lot. Wherever you live day to day, wherever you work day to day, wherever you interact day to day, that is your mission field, sharing out of our back doors the meaning of that very symbol, the cross. And without the character of God, without, without knowing the character of the God we worship, we won't be effective in connecting with the lost. In fact, if you were to draw a 15-mile radius around Centenary, we were, we were in the process of, of 
bringing on a communication staff member right now, a person who will be paying attention to the, the whole of our communications ministry. And Scott Hersey and I were interviewing a person last week. And we began to talk to this person about the radius of Centenary. And this person began to tell us some things that they already knew about the radius because of some tools that they're familiar with. And it's amazing how many people are in a 15 mile radius of this place, 2800 Tates Creek Road, who have no clue really what the cross means. But we must we must, as the people of God, especially in this time, more than any other time, know why we believe what we believe and what we believe and what Jesus did for us on the cross. Sitting there, God hasn't blessed us with success. God has blessed us with potential to obey what we've been taught. Our potential is the number of people in our community who don't know Jesus Christ. Last week we asked the question, how do we communicate what the church adds to a person's life instead of what it subtracts from a person's life? Remember we talked about that. And oh my, this community already knows all too well what the church subtracts. They can tell you what Christianity means you have to give up because we focused on that, haven't we? We focused on that over and over again, the don'ts of Christianity. And we've often, as Christian communities, set ourselves up as judge and jury of folks outside the church. We've even become, at times, the morality police when our only call is to teach and to love. Those are our calls, to teach and to love. Remember the quote from Billy Graham I used last week? It's the Holy Spirit's job to convict it's God's job to judge. It's my job to love. So much easier to tell people what the rules are because you can do that in a very quick moment and then leave. But to live life, to walk alongside those who still need to know Jesus, that's commitment. That takes time. It means that we can't stay in our holy huddles, our circles of Christians. It means we have to circulate outside of those circles. And here's the bottom line. Many people are more familiar with what the church subtracts, as I said. And we want to be known for what the church adds positively to a person's life. We are to love this community. We are to love our neighbors, our schools, our businesses. All of that is included in our call. And here's the key to reaching people for Jesus Christ. Saying yes to those who've said no. Now hear that. We must, as the church, especially in this new time that we find ourselves, learn to say yes to those who have said no. Jesus gave us a very significant clue about what we're to do based on what he said he had come to do. Luke 19, 1 through 10, tells the story of Zacchaeus. You know it. If you don't know the story, you know the song. Zacchaeus was a wee little man. A wee little man was he. Remember that? And what kind of tree did he climb up? Sycamore tree. And Jesus was walking along, and Zacchaeus, because he was of short stature, climbed so that he could see above the crowd. I th I've always believed that maybe he was just hiding, too, because, as you know, he didn't like, many people didn't like Zacchaeus. Um, he wasn't a popular guy. He was a tax collector. And he had stolen from people. He made them pay more than they owed. But he had heard about this Jesus, and so he climbed that tree to watch Jesus walk by. And out of all those people, because you see how all these crowds uh, crowd around these political figures right now as we move toward election day, it would have been even bigger crowds. Because it was word of mouth. People told each other about Jesus. So out of all that big crowd, Jesus looks up into that tree and he sees Zacchaeus and he focuses on the, the crook. Now, isn't that amazing? He didn't focus on all the people who were lauding him and just wanted to touch him and wanted to talk with him. He focused on the guy who was stealing money from poor people. 
And he said, Zacchaeus, come down. Not I want to meet you, not I want to talk about your sin. I don't, want to, I don't want to discuss the things that I've heard you've done wrong. Jesus knew who Zacchaeus was. He said, come down here because I want to go home with you and have lunch. Wow. Now that's the model of Christ. That's the model of Christ. And because Jesus loved Zacchaeus, with the kind of love that we've been given the ability to love as well once we say yes to Christ. You have that same ability to love that way once you've said yes to Jesus. Because Jesus loved Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus not only stopped ripping people off, he paid back the people that he ripped off and he paid them back even more than he had taken from them. You see, that's what the kind of that's what kind of Jesus love can do to a person. Jesus made it clear he has come to seek and to save those far from God. Now, who are the lost? It's a careful subject. That word lost is really not even in anymore. Many of my colleagues who are in a younger generation will say, James, don't use lost. That's, that's probably not a good word to use. Folks will turn you off if you use that word. And, and, and that's probably true, but lost is, is a pretty good way to describe what we're talking about this morning. So it's a careful subject. And again, we don't judge. God's the judge. We make decisions based on Scripture at times, sure. And because of that, we're sometimes accused of judgment, but Scripture outlines clearly who's lost and who, another controversial word in 2021, who's saved. It outlines clearly who's lost and who's saved. Those who are lost are people who have not only said no to Jesus, they've said no to the church, and they've said no to what we believe in the church. There are often people who feel like the church, though, and this is the most important part of this, they are often people who believe the church has said no to them. That's the most important part of this message. Now, we've been in the past ever ready to jump on that first part. Folks who said no to the church. Those who've said no to us. But the second part is most important, and that's our focus. And that's, hear this, that's our correction, too. This is our correction. We often said no to the lost first before they said no to us. And as we continue to move through the pandemic and beyond, Centenary, I gotta tell you, is here to say yes to those who said no. People who have said no to what we believe and God will work in the hearts of those as we love them and share the true gospel with them. You know, it's not our job to to follow people around and be the morality police. That's not what we're supposed to do as the people of God. If we examine each other, you can examine my whole life. I can examine your whole life. I'll always, you'll always find something you don't agree with. Something that says, hey, I thought you were a Christian. We all have those things. What we're called to do is to bring people into the love of Christ and let the Holy Spirit do the rest. People who have said no to the church, people who have said no to Jesus, and people who just don't know, because there are lots of those. That's our focus coming out of this pandemic. This will require us to push back against insider thinking. We'll have to push back on it. We'll have to be careful because it comes so natural to us. Insider thinking is being concerned with the insiders only. And in order to love the way I'm telling you Jesus taught Christ followers to love, we have to be intentional about not focusing on small circles of Christians. Holy huddles, as I said. We mean well. I'm not, I'm not beating us up for it. We do mean well. But it's against the teachings of Christ to make that our total focus. 
We must move our fences and we must, we must draw the circle bigger. That's our call. We have to draw that circle wide and large. The way, the way, the way of Christ is narrow. Hear that. The way of Christ is narrow. But we are to walk that narrow path in crowds and in groups that are large. Knowing that some will stumble off the path as we go. Some will fall and we'll help pick them back up. And some will even leave the path on the way. They'll leave it. But through our love and our intentional efforts to include, many will at the end walk through that narrow gate into eternity. They will. The only requirement for heaven is absolute positive belief that Jesus Christ was the son of the living God. And we're called to take as many people. I believe that every one of you, or most of you in this room, would say yes to that. But we are to take as many people with us as possible. And that takes work. If we're going to make a difference, if we're going to, to take people with us as we walk through the gate, it will require us as a church body to push against insider thinking. We're asking no one to follow Christ perfectly. That's not what we're doing. That's why we have grace. We only want to love people and sometimes people that we will vehemently disagree with. Now, there's a thought right now. The natural path in any organization is toward insider thinking. Now, you've heard me talk about this before in the past if you've been here very long, but I've only touched on it briefly. I want to go a little deeper, and little did I know that we would need this teaching even more because of the state of our world right now when I began to think through some of this. But in the church world, we rarely get calls from outsiders saying, if you'll do this, we might start attending church. I don't think I've ever got a call like that. No, instead we get emails or anonymous letters, aren't those fun, saying, if you don't do this, or if you you don't play this style of music or if you don't add this service time or if you don't launch this program we're going to leave those are the kind of communications we we normally get in the church unfortunately and if we aren't careful you see we we've done it the church is responsible for for letting people and teaching people that that's okay and, and, and if we aren't careful we start building centenary and we're in a building phase make no mistake the centenary you knew seven months ago is no longer. We are now in a building phase. But we have so many resources to do what Christ has called us to do. That's the blessing of this. And if we're not careful, we will start building centenary around people who are already going to spend eternity in heaven. The best kind of church for you to, to attend, let me, let me make sure I say this clearly. The best type of church for you to attend is not one that caters to you, but instead invites you into the mission of focusing on those who are far from God. That's Jesus. And I can tell you there aren't a lot of people lining up for that. There really aren't. We, we do quick spurts of ministry. We write checks and we come for an hour on a Sunday morning. But living life, doing life with people who are not like us, who act differently, who smell differently, who are at different income levels, doing ministry with, with, with people, we're into that. But doing ministry, or, or for people I should say, we're into that, but doing ministry with people is often foreign to us. It's hard to get that crew to sign on the dotted line. Please hear this if you hear nothing else today. This is the mission of Jesus, seeking and saving the lost. And because you're going to worship something, you're either going to worship Jesus as an idol, 
which many of us have made the mistake of doing, or you're going to worship Jesus as the Savior of the world. And this Savior is not like any other self-proclaimed to focus on a picture or a statue of him until he returns. Today I want to ask you to serve with Jesus. To serve with Centenary. That's what I'm asking you. Why do you have this this gnawing feeling sometimes that this stuff may not be real. Admit it, you've, you've thought it. Why do you have this, this gnawing feeling that our worship is sometimes just dry and, and ho-hum? Here's why. Because you will never know what the church can do for you or the world truly until you experience what the church can do through you. That's why you struggle with that. Once you've experienced what the church can can do through you, a whole new world opens up. But we have been mostly focused on what the church could do for me. Not It's not an annual mission trip, although mission trips are wonderful. It's not once a week at Common Good. It's not once a month at Nathaniel Mission. But it is consistently seeking ways to be in relationship, to be in community with those who are lost consistently, daily, sharing Jesus Christ with those who do not yet know him. That can happen at school, that can happen at work, it can happen next door to you, it can happen as you walk, as you go to the gym, it can happen in so many places, so many ways that we're involved in every day. How? How, you might say. We aren't experts, we're learning, (laughs) we're still learning, we're doing a pretty good job of learning, I'll say that, but we're still learning. But these three ways I'm about to share with you aren't original. They came straight from the Apostle Paul. You just heard me read it just a few moments ago when he went to Athens. First, he spoke straight truth. He didn't beat around the bush. He didn't say, in order to to get these people, I've got to water this thing down. He didn't say that. He spoke straight truth. He said, he looked at those people and he said, you're religious, but you don't know Jesus. So that's the first way is just saying it straight. He said, you know the rules, but you bring no one to Christ. The second thing he did was walk among them. And I was behind on my sermon slides this week, so I didn't get this up. But I want you to hear this. He first spoke straight truth in this passage. The next thing he did was walk among them and listen. He was out in the marketplace, you saw here. He was out around the community. He was talking to them. He was building relationships. And the last thing he did was he called them to worship the one true God. Not as an idol, but as their creator. That's what we do. And hear me, it's right here. I mean, I didn't didn't come up with this. It's right in this scripture lesson that I read to you just now. You don't question the creator. You can question the creator, but it's probably not going to change a whole lot. We follow the path of the creator. Here's some quick context to our scripture passage. Leading up to Paul's speech, we just read here, he went out into the community, he saw, he walked around, he observed. And we want to do the same. We want to do the exact same things in the coming days we want to stand by and know what we believe so that we can share that with the world because you know what most of these folks want to know that we don't compromise because if we compromise and if we water down then we're no different than most organizations in this world 
We need to listen. We need to let people know we love them. We need to say yes to them more than we say no. So Paul stood up in this meeting and he said to them what Jesus left for him to say. And no matter what part of centenary you have found yourself in, whether it's just an attender once in a while or whether you're deeply involved in the ministry of the church, those three things must be our focus in the days to come. John Wesley used what he called bands to do that. You start out in a small group, that's okay, and you follow up with that same small group to support one another and to learn a common language. But when you leave that band, that small group, you become a snowball and your circle grows and grows and grows to include people who do not know Christ yet. And that builds a common language and that builds relationships. Jim Cimbala is the pastor of the Brooklyn Tabernacle. Many of you have heard of Jim. He tells the story of when he was a young pastor. He made this flyer as he started that church in downtown Brooklyn to put up on the light poles all around the neighborhood to see if people would come to church. He put his, his service time on those light poles. And he was telling this story and he said, I remember I, I made that, that flyer and I was taking it, this was back in the days when you made it and then you had to take it to be you know, put in, a, in a, a roll copy or kind of thing. And he was taking it to the store down the street to have the flyers made so that he could go and put these flyers up all around the city. And he was talking with God, he says, as he was walking to that printer to have those flyers duplicated. And he was almost there and God spoke to his heart and said, Jim... I didn't call you to get people to come to your church. I called you to walk among the people of Brooklyn, to stand on the word of God among them, to listen to them, and to walk alongside me as I seek and save the lost. Jim, he said, he said he heard it as clear as day from God. Jim, if you do that, church attendance will take care of itself. Wow. God said, that's what I called you to do. And Jim Cimbala said he threw that flyer in the public trash can. He was almost to the store to have it duplicated. And he said, that day I walked around town I walked around Brooklyn the rest of that day just telling people about Jesus. And of course, they now have 6,000 worshipers in that church and 300 in their choir. You see, we worship while we walk, my friends. We worship while we walk. You will worship. You will. That's a given. That's for sure. You're going to worship. But do you know why? Would you pray with me? God, thank you for everyone in this room. I thank you for the marvelous ways that you have shown us your power and your glory. I thank you, oh God, that you are a God who loves us in spite of us in spite of our shortcomings, in spite of our mistakes. And Lord, you just called us to love people the same way. So we ask this day that as we leave this place, we would leave with full hearts, ready to worship you in a way that maybe we never have worshiped you before. Ready to be Christ, the people that you put in our paths. And Lord, we thank you that you are so good and that you've given us this time today to find out why we've said yes to you. We pray these things in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen and amen.